Okay, so we were talking about Denver and being on the road and rooming with Alan Wilson. Yeah, that, 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 was, uh, that was a good one. Yeah. And um, so w when you guys, when you, after Denver, did you guys, like, start doing full-on tours for long? We worked so Wilson. hard. You know, it's popularity comes. We had our first hit record. And what was your first hit? On the road again. On the road, okay. You know, and, yeah. uh, inspired by John Lee Hooker. Uh, yeah, Floyd Strait Jones. And yeah. Floyd Jones, yeah. of right. course. Floyd Jones for the lyrics a little right. bit, you know. And then the John Lee Hooker right. influence of right. playing in the one boogie, chord, the boogie and playing thing, a boogie yeah. kind of right. a lick. And then we also use the tampora effect because in those times oh, that's we right. were including that's the right. Indian that's thing. Right. Yeah, the and, sitar. At the and, and, and one of the things that Alan and Bob used to insist on and, and, and love was the drone. Right. And that's the blues too. I mean, there's so is. much blues music. There that's is right. one key, the drone. Right. John Lee Hooker will be the, the, the best expert and yeah. the master yeah. of that. Yeah. You know, because John also changed sometimes. He will go to the fifth core and fourth. Right. Only when I want to. Yeah. I don't change because I don't want to change. Not because I don't know. It was sort of like say. lightning. Same thing with lightning. I don't want yeah. to change. Yeah. That's why I always say John Lee Hooker, he kind of established, he broke the rules on the blues, but at the same time, he also established other rules mm -hmm. in the blues. Sure did. You know, he was a disruptor. Yes. Definitely. Yes. And using that word now, they use it in your now times, a disruptor. What a better disruptor than, than John Lee Hooker well, coming he was, here saying, I'm going to play with one core. And he was really, and he was really kind of like a one man, he was, to me, he was a one man band, the way well, he yeah, played. The, the foot and Between the, the foot and, the, and the, the way he could fill up all that sound on the guitar with the different tunings yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. So, and, you know, so yeah. as, as, you, as you know, by listening to Cam Heath music, John Lee Hooker's influence is like, I don't know, more than 50%. Oh, yeah. yeah. Of all the music we made. Yeah. I mean, we always loved John Lee Hooker. And another thing is, I actually was aware of John Lee Hooker before I even came to the U.S. because of Javier Batiste. He had a few ah, records okay. of John Lee right. Hooker. Yeah. So I would bring my Jimmy Reed record, and he would have his John Lee Hooker records, and uh, we would listen to them. You right. know, it was really, right. really something. So, yeah. yeah, On the Road Again happened, and we had we enjoyed popularity on a scale that I never even expected. I never even wanted it. Yeah. I yeah. came to this country because I wanted to play black music. Right. I was already in heaven at the Tomcat Club. Right. You know, <laughs> I just bought myself a five or 400. Right. And right. We were, I was playing five nights a week. I mean, I was great, you know. Yeah. We had a band called The Creations, Larry Barnes and The Creations. Two guys from Tennessee, a Texan, and two Mexicans. Somehow, <laughs> somehow this band sounded like a black band, you wow. know? It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Because we were in this club where most of the guest artists were black. Right. But they accepted us. Yeah. And uh, it, it was just a wonderful part of my life, you know, before Cam Heath. Right. But then, as I said, we had on the road again and we started touring and we went to Europe for the first time. And that's when everything exploded. I mean, we became... Well, I guess in 68, we probably were America's number one band. I don't know, 68, 69. I don't know if there was any other band, you know, doing as much work as we were doing. Right, right. You know, there were a lot of bands coming up still, but. Now you, I saw a thing about that Sunnyland Slim was driving a cab. And driving guys... a cab. And you know, I even have somewhere his, his card. His card, yeah. I have his personal card that says, the blues and rock and roll. Really? On Sunny so, Lance? I Lance wish Kong? I could find I mean, yeah. I have it somewhere. If you but give me some you, time, I'll show you. Did you guys, me. did you guys find him in Chicago? I mean, did he pick you, you know, up and give you a the, ride? The history, I don't know if I was in that car okay. myself because I know he played on the boogie with Ken Heat Records. So I must have been there. I don't recall. Yeah. But according to the story is that we found him on a, on a drive in a taxi car. Mm -hmm. And when we saw his name, on the on the meter, right? Is right. when Bob must have blown it. Are you are Honey Sunny Land Slim? My yeah. God, you know. Wow. And then we they invited him to. I, I don't know if I was there, but I know they invited him to to join join us and play with us. Right. And we feature him in uh, a couple of songs. One of the ones is Turpentine Moon. Right. 
from Boogie with Kane. Pete. Right. Okay. And that's yeah. that's the Sonny Lamb there. You and know? you're on that record. Yeah, I'm yeah. on that record okay. too. Yes. That's and then the and then Gate Mouth Brown or something did something in Europe with you guys. Yes, we did. We did. A, we did a record with Gate Mouth Brown and with Memphis Slim. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. All on the same night. Wow. And this was kind of forceful. You know, all the pressure to playing with a, with a band. You know, I. Uh, we were playing at the Olympia in Paris. Right. And uh, after the gig, this uh, French promoter called Philippe Rolt, a real tall guy, really kind of funny, very nice guy. Mm -hmm. He says, I have a castle and a studio in the castle, and we would like to invite you if you want to, to play and maybe make a record with Memphis Slim. Wow. And Carclarin's Gate Mouth Brown. Crazy. And you know, we were really tired. Yeah. And we said, yeah, we'll do it anyway, you know, take some Benzedrine or something. And, <laughs> and, 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 and we went there to the castle yeah. and we managed to do the record, which this didn't work out as good. I'm going to tell you the story because it's really funny. Okay. When we were actually doing the record with, with uh, Gatemouth, yeah. you have to realize that Henry Vesting was kind of a southern guy and he had the... Confederate flag. Oh God, yeah. Tattooed on that his couldn't arm. have gone over big. That didn't go over really, really well with no. with Clarence. I mean, yeah. Gatebelt Brown was also kind of uptight. He was a sheriff. Yeah, that's what I. He heard. was a sheriff yeah, in I New Mexico. That. Right. He didn't really like this smoking, you know, weed smoking hippies and right, shit. You right. know what I mean? Long hair. But sure. you know, he did, he did, he did respect the canned heat because mm. some of those guys, even if we, you know, we are inspired by them. They knew about Cam Heat and right. they respected the, the yeah. fact that we were doing this music. Right. So Clarence gets up to go to the bathroom and Henry goes, his guitar is out of tune. I'm going to tune it. <laughs> so now you Big know. Mistake. There is a guy with a Confederate yeah. flag Tuning and with a southern guitar. accent yeah. from, right. from South Carolina and all yeah. that. And, and Clarence comes back from the bathroom and notices that somebody messed with his guitar. Yeah. Boy, that created a whole scene. Who messed with my guitar? Who tuned my guitar? You don't touch my guitar. And Henry goes, when it was out of tune, what do you want? It wasn't out of tune. I know how to tune my guitar. Well, anyway, it went on and off, on and off, and the whole vibe of the session, you know, got ruined. Real uptight, yeah. So yeah. when you hear that record, it's actually... Clarence Gate Mouth Brown and some French musicians. Ah, oh, okay. I think there's only one cut with Cam Heat. Really? Yeah. The rest, they, they, they didn't even use, use it. it huh? Wow. Because I guess the guitar was out of tune or the yeah. vibe was not there. Yeah. But he decided to put it out and call it Clarence, Clarence Gate Mouth Brown with the Heat. Yeah. And he, also, he only used one or two songs. I, I, I cannot recognize anything there. Wow. I know I didn't play on it. Huh. It sounds like French musicians. Yeah. Give me a break. But I mean, there, is, there, there is there is a, a, a TV show with That's you. a different thing. Right. The show that is around, that is all over the place, that's right. the Montreux Jazz Festival. That's right. That's right. Again, with Clarence Gate Bro. Right. You know, and this is already after, I guess, they work it out, Henry and him. They were friends again. And so, and so you guys backed them. So we backed him at the right. uh, at the Montreux Jazz Festival, right. and that's what is film. It's film, and you can I see it. I think he plays harmonic on that. He plays harmonic right. on that. He was yeah. great. I mean, man, he right. was he's so talented. He played the, the oh, yeah, film. The violin. He, he played the violin. He played the guitar. Uh, he was a great guitar. band leader. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, played the harmonica. Yeah. All that. It, it was really a privilege, and I'm I'm so glad that we have that uh, video around. You know, it's. it's Still available even in our right. in my right. website and all that, yeah. you know of of, of Gate Mouth Brown with the Canned Heat, but that was live. Yeah, that's not the recording. Not the recording. The recording no. in the castle no. when the fight with the you know <laughs> the southern guy with the black guy. You know what I mean. So now the the the, <laughs> the Hooker and Heat album was that 1970. Yes, that's before Alan died. Right before Alan died, was that the last thing Alan did? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and he didn't even get to hear the last product. Oh, that's sad. He didn't get to mix it or anything. Yeah. Uh, actually, the mixing was done in London, I believe. Huh. Uh, we met John Lee Hooker in Portland. We were arriving at the airport, picking up our stuff, and we see this black guy picking up an old guitar mm -hmm. on the carousel, a couple of carousels away from us. 
I know what was so involved goes, that's John Lee Hooker. And you met Albert Collins the same way. Albert Collins, that's different. But, but that was in an airport, wasn't no, it? No, no, no. Albert oh, Collins, we actually was, okay. went looking for him. Oh, okay. I thought it was in an airport. <coughs> okay. we, we met John Lee Hooker at the, at the Portland airport. He was picking up his guitar, and we ran towards him. I mean, we were so excited to actually meet John, you know, because we've been listening to his music all right. the time. I mean, right. <coughs> so... We went to see him. Hi, John, we're the Canned Heat Band. We really love your music. I, 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 I like the way you boys boogie. <laughs> that's, that's what he said. He wow. knew about yeah, us. Yeah, that's awesome. I like the way you boys boogie. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's when the idea came to make a record. Right. You know, Bob says, man, we have to make a record together. Right. And this must have been in 1968 or 69 because it yeah. took almost a year or more for the record companies, yeah. the record companies, that was the problem. Right. John was an ABC, ABC Paramount or whatever right. the label right. was, and we were in Liberty. Right. So they had to do the negotiating and all that, but finally we did the session, and it was a remarkable session. It was wonderful. And it really brought his career out big time, Yes, because right? that time that we met him, he was playing in some... Shit, little gig, you yeah, know, really probably making fifty dollars or something yeah, by right, himself. Right. Uh, nobody knew about John Lee Hooker, right. you know, which is incredible. I know, I know. So, it's so, so thank God that we we, we yeah. made that record. He got yeah. more recognition, right? And then Whiskey and Women became a hit. And it's a great record. It's a good record. It yeah. is really a good record. And you, you know, guys, most of them are first a lot of, lot of simpatico between. Alan Especially and him and Alan, but also just the whole band, the band sound on Yeah, and one thing about John, that he didn't like harmonica players very much. I know. That was one of the few records where it worked. You know that? Oh, yeah. But he liked Alan. Yeah. Because yeah. he didn't like harmonica players that paid too much. He used well, to you say, know what the deal they was? They paid too much. They made too much noise. He used Alan to really followed him. Alan like knew. a hawk. Alan knew exactly yeah. what John would yeah. want, yeah. you see. He, he and laid I, back and waited for... And that's right, that's right. So yeah. I, I, I didn't know if you knew that about John, but he didn't like harmonica no, players. I knew because that. I, yeah. I asked him to... When, when I played with him later, right. you know, I played with, in his band for, right. for the last two years of his life. Okay. I was his drummer, too. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember one time there was a couple of harmonica players that wanted to sit in, and he didn't let him. Yeah. Yeah. Only the ones he knew. I think he'd let Muscle White sit in, or people know. he knew yeah. that you know. But yeah. otherwise, he wouldn't go for it. Right. So I can understand that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, the, the sessions with John were fantastic. I mean, it was great to be able to play just just on the moment. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't like to play more than two takes. Right. You know, that's a blues thing. That's a blues thing. He used to yeah. call it stupid shit. Right. You, you want to do more than two takes, that's a stupid show. Right. right. You know, so it's wonderful. I mean, yeah. the, the record you know, just shows it there. And then Whiskey and Women became a hit on the black stations. Wow. And, man, was I proud of myself that time that I'm driving down the 101 or somewhere, and I hear KGFJ. Right. You remember KGFJ? Yeah, sure I do. The Magnificent yeah. Manicure. You bet. I sure Magnificent Manicure and KGFJ right. playing Canned Heat and John Lee Hooker. That's awesome. You know, Whiskey and Women. Whiskey and Women was a hit. Right. In the black stations. Yeah. You know, so that, that made me so yeah. proud. That you is know? awesome. Yeah. It was wonderful. And then we did yeah. touring with him, too. We played at the Carnegie Hall with him. And wow. We did a lot of touring with him. And, and mm -hmm. uh a lot of partying with him too. You know? <laughs> uh, it was <laughs> we, he was a character. A lot man. of things. It was a character. Yeah. And then and Bob and the boys boy. were. I mean, you know, one time they put MDA on his beer. Oh my God! We got him high. Uh huh. He used to smoke a little bit now and then. Did he? Yeah. He smoked yeah. a little weed now and then, and he drank beer. Right. So <laughs> this time we, I don't know who. I think Bob put a little MDA on his on his beer. Right. And John all of a sudden said, I want to do what I say. <laughs> He's never done what I say, but that night that he took MDA, he decided to do what I say. And man, the version he did of what I say was just fantastic. Was it? I heard it live. I never heard it recorded. Right. But it was, baby, what I say. Baby, what I say. The whole one core thing without changing. And then he will still go, tell your mom, tell your pop, 
Baby, what I say? <laughs> he definitely made things his own. He dude. made it his own. Yeah. And it, 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 yeah. on top of the NDA, I mean, he just came out with this That's new funny. idea, you know? Yeah. We had a great time with John Lee Hooker. What a great. So uh, you got to tell us about Woodstock. Well, what else do you want to know? I, I told the story about Woodstock stole, many times. I told it a lot of times. But now, now, as I recall, you guys, what was the deal with not being filmed? Was that Skip? No, no, no. Or, or did they just say... Well, one of the things is Skip signed the film contract loaded on acid on the stage. Wow. I remember we were playing. Yeah. And I turned to see him. He had taken acid before we took the helicopter. <laughs> so he was buzzing all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Skip, Alan, and Bob took acid. Yeah. Larry, Harvey, and me didn't. Yeah. But the three of them were loaded on acid. So I remember I'm playing and I turn and I see my manager with all these papers there. And Chipmunk is there. Chipmunk was right, the... Right, right, right. The, uh, the promoter, yeah. One of the, no, no promoter, but the... The uh, MC. The MC. Right, right. Chip Moon and the promoter was there too, the guy with the motorcycle, Michael, Michael, Michael. Lang. Yeah, right. And it skipped there, you know, loaded on acid, signing contracts on the stage as we play. I mean, Sweet. that's Woodstock for you. How was, the, how was the concert? I mean, how did you guys feel like your performance was? Oh, you know, we play as loud and as hard as we could because we were trying to reach this right. half a million people, you know. Right. And we were already playing pretty loud in those But times. you guys did get filmed. We got filmed, not completely. I think they, they ran out. What happens is that they ran out of film in our performance. Oh. So that's why some of the solos and some of the songs are not there. Right. But they were, then they, they ended up using Going Up the Country as the theme song. Yeah, but they used the, the record. Oh, not the okay. live, right, not the right, live right, 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 right. And later on, you see, what happens is when they released the film, they chopped a lot of the important bands, including ourselves. Right. Because the film was released by Warner Brothers. Then we go with the, promo, the, the, the corporate bullshit, you know? Yeah, yeah. Warner Brothers wanted to show the film three times instead of two times a day. So they decided to cut Paul Borefield out. Janice right, I, Joplin, knew, I knew that they all got cut. Yeah, right, I, I knew mean, that. Yeah. Right. Bands that were, got... they were more important right. than the bands that they kept. Right. But right. we were not Warner Brothers acts. Right. They wanted to keep their acts in right. the film. Right. That's a politics and so bullshit. It was very political. You know? yeah. Political. How they yeah. how there they remove Janice Joplin and they remove Paul Borefield and yeah. can't hit and, they, and leave, and they, and leave they the had... incredible string band. Right. You right, know, and right. so well, you know, keep give me right. a break. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah, anyway. Weird. Yeah. So they cut they cut us all out so they could show the movie three times instead of two. That infuriated the director. Yeah. He got pissed off about it. He couldn't. He couldn't control it because he was not the producer. Right. And MGM were the producers. Right. Wow. So later on, they came out with what is called the director's cut. Okay. And that's guy you guys. That one has us back in playing all kinds of stuff. Okay. And it has Paul Borderfield. Right. And I think it has Janice too. Wow. The director's cut. If you're going to see Woodstock, you better see the director's cut, not right. the original film. Right. That was shown on the theaters. Yeah. Because that's really not the real thing. Well, I know with Joe, Listen. he told me that the only reason he was in it was because he played that little... I mean, his band played, the Fish played, but they only have him doing the break where he does Fixing a Die Rag, and that was a totally impromptu thing. You mean with Country Joe? Yeah, I'm saying when Joe did... You mean the Fish, fish was not in the, in, the, the, in the film? The Fish is not in the film. See, there you go. I didn't yeah. know about that. The, yeah. you know, so Barry Milton was with them. Right. They aren't in the film. See, they so caught they him out filmed, again but, because yeah. they were not MGM yeah. MGM right. acts. But so. he was lucky because his part at least got in because the Because of that song, they yeah, give me an F, give me a U, yeah, you know, that's yeah, the most famous. Yeah, yeah. I guess after going up the country, Joe's song is the most well, Woodstock. Pretty, it was pretty the known Woodstock, for Woodstock. The Woodstock yeah. song, you know. Pretty Woodstock, yeah. Of course, yeah. going up the country is really the theme. That was the theme. The thing. Yeah. Going up the country, up right. to the Catskill Mountains. Right, you know? exactly. Yeah. So now you guys just played festivals left and right that whole time. I tell you one thing about Camp Heat, and I'm not bragging. 
And he has played more biker festivals, more blues festivals and pop festivals than any other band around. Yeah. Why? Because those are the three sources of work that we get. We had hit records, so that makes us part of the 60s nostalgia trip. Right. We're also known as a blues band, which that also gets us into the blues market sometimes. Right, right. You see? And then you have the biker connection. And then we have the bikers. Yeah. Which yeah. is a part of the, of the whole yeah. thing. And we have played more biker festivals than anybody. Wow. I mean, I claim that after, you know, what, 54, 55 years playing with this band. I cannot think of any other band that has been active and playing so many festivals. And you, I and you guys were like managed by the Hells Angels, is that right? For a while, yes. Yeah. There, there, is, there was a time when Skip Taylor took a 20, 25 year break. Wow. And uh, at, that, at that time is when I was managing the band myself. You know, from the moment Skip left, I pretty much took over because Bob was not the kind of guy wasn't a business to, guy. To, yeah. to deal yeah. with the contracts and the right. agents and all that. Right. And I, I had a little more of business savvy. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I just took over because they didn't know what to do. Really. Right. Right. They were really musicians. And you and guys kind of had people coming in and out. I mean, you had Henry leave in what, 1969? Yeah. And, and then, yeah, Larry left too. Larry and Harvey left right. and, played and went with John Mayle. Right. So then we got Henry back. Right. Because the original reason why Henry left was because of Larry. Right. Larry and Henry never got along. Well, they got along in the beginning, but later on, Henry's drug intake yeah. was a little too much. So were they always kind of in and out? And, and if it was Larry, it wasn't Henry, and if it was Henry, it wasn't Larry. Yeah, but yeah. there, was times, oh, right. there were times when we, we, got it, we got him together again. You did? In okay. the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got him together and we, we play and we continue. And then later on, Larry again, for the fourth or fifth time, he pushed Henry out of the band. And that's when Junior Watson came in. Right, right. Because Larry wanted us to play more original, uh, traditional blues. blues. Traditional blues. Yeah. Henry didn't right. want to do that anymore. Henry right. believed that Ken he was a rock blues band. Right. And he wanted to play loud and, and, and yeah. you know. But I remember opening for you guys one time when it was both of those guys. Larry and Henry. No, it was Henry and Junior. Yes. That, now, that was a great unit. That was one yeah. of the best lineups I put together. I want to say it was probably 95. Yeah, around the 90s, yeah. yes. There was a time where I, yeah, this is already when Larry's not there. Larry's playing right. with uh, Tom Waits right. and with the Hollywood Fats Band. Mm -hmm. So I came with the idea of having Watson and Henry because they are both so different. Yeah. You see? Right. And the band sounded powerful. I, I took that band to Europe and I took him to Australia and we did great. And we played here too. That's when you saw us. Right. And I used to call that band the heavy artillery. Right. Because it was, it felt like heavy artillery. I mean, that's what we call that unit, the, the heavy artillery lineup. Well, I remember um, backstage, I'd never seen somebody with the DTs like, like Henry. Oh, and they had Yeah, he was like, literally like that. I mean, and backstage. That was, that was in the 90s. I that mean, was 95, yeah. Well, he died yeah. in 97.